Welcome to the Conscience of Kansas radio show with Paul A. Ibbotson, a no-nonsense conservative talk show that looks at the local, state, and national issues that affect the people of Kansas. And now, here's Paul A. Ibbotson. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special topic, an unbelievable story that really pertains to the military and to our state as well as Oklahoma. And we have Vicki Behenna. She is the mother of Army Ranger First Lieutenant Michael Behenna. And Vicki, we'd like to welcome you to the program. Paul, thank you very much for having me. I thank you for coming on the show. I really want to get this story out to our Kansas radio listeners. I was wondering if you could walk our folks a little bit through Michael's story and just what all has befallen him. Sure. And I'll try to to do the short version here. Uh, Michael deployed with the 101st Airborne as a young second lieutenant in September 2007. Uh, he was in Iraq in an area known as Beji. Uh, his area of operation was uh, difficult in that they faced IEDs fairly regularly in RPGs. Mm-hmm. At the end of March in 2008, Michael's area of responsibility was an Iraqi police station that sat out on the desert. It had been bombed once before. And so Michael res- was responsible for building a perimeter security around there, making sure that they were safe and, and protected from further attack. While the platoon was out, and Michael's platoon was only an 18-man platoon. It was rather small. Um, the platoon was out at the Iraqi police station, and Michael Michael got a call from the FOB, from the intelligence officer, that said he had received some intelligence information that an Iraqi policeman by the name of Ali Mansour was planning on embedding an IED and was organizing that and to hit the platoon when they left the Iraqi police station. And so we told Michael to take another route back to the FOB so that they didn't hit this IED. Uh-huh. And they were successful that time. They weren't hit. They weren't so successful on April 21st. On April 21st, Michael's platoon is out on patrol. They're hit by an IED. The IED kills two of Michael's soldiers, kills two Iraqis that are traveling with the platoon, and seriously injures the platoon sergeant and a company medic. After that attack, Michael read a military intelligence report that identified that al-Qaeda was responsible for the attack, that Ali Mansour was a member of that al-Qaeda cell, and that uh, his responsibility was to Uh, transport explosives, and to report on the movement of coalition forces in the desert. Michael reads that report. He gets information from the local sheikh about where Mansour lived. The platoon on May 5th goes out to Mansour's house, and they detain him. They take him into custody. Uh Michael thinks that's it. He he won't hear from Ali Mansour anymore. Unfortunately, 10 days later, on May 15th, Michael is told that Ali Mansour is going to be released. Michael reads the interrogation reports. He finds out that no questions were asked about his ties to al-Qaeda, who was funding the al-Qaeda cell, why he was traveling back and forth to Syria. So Michael asked the intelligence officer, well, it was actually a sergeant that actually conducted the interrogation on the FOB, to conduct another interrogation, obtain more information. They do. He provides the names of some known members of al-Qaeda, but the the sergeant tells Michael it doesn't really matter what he says. He's been ordered for lease, and you're ordered to take him home. Michael's company commander told Michael to take uh, Mansoor home. Hmm. Michael, uh, to try to protect himself and his platoon from further attack, uh, decides that he's going to conduct his own interrogation, and he does that. He takes uh, Mansoor and his interpreter out to a culvert in the desert. He seats Mansoor, and these culverts aren't drainage culverts like we're used to in Kansas and Oklahoma. These are 10 by 10 culverts that go underneath railroad tracks in the desert. Okay. Uh, So it's Michael, the interpreter, and Mansoor. Michael seats Mansoor, unties him. I mean, he's not tied. Seats him on a rock, kind of concrete debris is really what it is in this tunnel. Mm -hmm. Michael is standing about two feet from him. The interpreter is kind of uh, behind Michael to his left, and they begin asking him questions about al-Qaeda and who was responsible for the April 21st attack. Michael understands a little bit of Arabic and knew that Mansour kept saying, I don't know anything. And at one point in time, Mansour gives a response that Michael didn't understand. At that point in time, he looks Michael looks over his left shoulder to get the translation from his interpreter. When he does that, he says he hears concrete or rock hit the side of the culvert by his head. When he turns back, Mansoor is now standing. His arm, his right arm is outstretched. Michael thinks he's reaching for his gun, so Michael shoots a controlled pair and kills him. Okay. Then what happens? (laughs) 
Michael's charged with the premeditated murder of Ali Mansour and um, goes to trial about this time last year, February of 09, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, and that's when the story goes from bad to worse. Michael had a self-defense defense. It, it, I mean, he described what happened in the culvert much like I described to you. Right. Uh, there were two uh, defense forensic experts that testified at trial. Those experts said, based upon the trajectory of the bullets, the autopsy showed that the trajectory of both bullets were horizontal or level. There are two shots, one that enters under the right armpit, okay, Mm -hmm. and the other one the right temple. So the defense experts testified that Mansour was not seated. It's impossible for him to be seated uh, on a rock and executed in the head, which is what the government's theory was, because the trajectory of the bullets were not downward, and they were horizontal level. Mm -hmm. And so the defense experts said and testified that they believed that based upon the forensic evidence that Mansour was standing at the time he was shot. The first shot was not the shot to the head, but under the right armpit. They believe that his right arm was outstretched or up because the way the bullet entered the body under the right armpit, had his arm been down by his side, it would have penetrated the flesh or the bone of his right arm. So they believe, based upon the forensic evidence that Mansour was standing, that uh, that the first shot is under the right arm. The second shot is the shot to the right temple. As his body starts to fall to the ground from the first injury, Michael's shooting the control pair, hits him in the right temple, and um, that it it corroborated Michael's version of self-defense. What we didn't know uh, until after Michael was convicted was the government had their own expert, a man by the name of Dr. Herbert McDonald. Herbert McDonald Donald told the prosecutors on Wednesday during Michael's trial, I don't think your theory makes sense. It doesn't fit the forensic evidence. I don't believe he was seated on a rock when he was shot. I believe, and he gives them a demonstration, uh, and he shows them that the only logical explanation for the shooting was that Mansour was standing, and the first shot is the first shot under the right armpit, and his arm is up and outstretched. That's what he tells the prosecutor. Prosecutors do not, even though they have an obligation under Brady versus Maryland and Mm -hmm. turn over exculpatory or favorable evidence, they don't tell the defense lawyers about their experts' opinion. Wow. On Thursday, Michael testifies at his own trial, much like I just described to you about what happened. Mm -hmm. Dr. McDonald is in the courtroom, and he listens to Michael testify. And he says to another colonel that's sitting there, another government expert, Colonel Berg, He says, oh, my God. After Michael explains what happened, he says, oh, my God. That's exactly what I explained to you guys yesterday. That's the demonstration I gave you. This kid's telling the truth. This is the only way this shooting could have occurred. Well, let me ask you a few questions. I want to get the facts out there. So I'm glad that you laid this all out there. And you laid it out there in the very factual way that U.S. attorneys do. I'm a former Kansas chief of police. And so I'm used to hearing it in that way. And that's the best way, I think, for our listeners to hear. Let me ask you a couple questions. I'm like, I think what everybody listening to this program, we're going to be trying to wrap our heads around how this, how the end result could be how it is. Lieutenant Behenna, your boy, and this interpreter and this terrorist, are they the only people out there? Were there any other eyewitnesses? Were there any kind of surveillance drones or camera pics? Were there any other thing other than those three individuals out when this incident happened? There was another sergeant, uh, uh, Sergeant Warner, who was, uh, who followed Michael out to uh, the interrogation point. Okay. He says, and he testified during the trial, that at the time the first shot was fired, while Michael's doing the interrogation, Uh and he hears the first shot, he's off relieving himself. Okay. So he's not there. He doesn't see what happened. Now, he testified on behalf of the government, though, and he testified as a, quote, eyewitness, because he says that he he ran from, he was a position about 35 meters away, uh, relieving himself. Right. That when he heard the first shot, he ran 35 meters in two seconds and saw Mansoor was in a standing position and when Michael shot the second shot. Now, that I don't still know. corroborates Michael's story if he's standing, this guy's standing. What about the interpreter? What was his testimony, or was there any testimony from him? There was. He was also a government witness, and he said, yes, Mansoor was seated at the time the shot was fired. His role in it was to say that Mansoor was seated. Uh-huh. But he does, on cross examination, admit he did not see the shooting. He was looking at Michael. When Michael turned to look at him, he turned to look at Michael. He don't. He doesn't remember. He doesn't know. He didn't see if Mansoor made a move or was standing at the time the first shot was fired because he was looking at uh, the lieutenant.